Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Y. Davis Chapter 5 The Prison Industrial Complex For private business, prison labor is like a pot of gold. No strikes, no union organizing, no health benefits, unemployment insurance, or workers' compensation to pay. No language barriers, as in foreign countries. New Leviathan prisons are being built on thousands of eerie acres of factories inside the walls. Prisoners do data entry for Chevron, make telephone reservations for TWA, raise hogs, shovel manure, and make circuit boards, limousines, waterbeds, and lingerie for Victoria's Secret, all at a fraction of the cost of free labor. That's a quote from Linda Evans and Eve Goldberg. The exploitation of prison labor by private corporations is one aspect among an array of relationships linking corporations, government, correctional communities, and media. These relationships constitute what we now call a prison industrial complex. The term prison industrial complex was introduced by activists and scholars to contest prevailing beliefs that increased levels of crime were the root cause of mounting prison populations. Instead, they argued, prison construction and the attendant drive to fill these new structures with human bodies have been driven by ideologies of racism in the pursuit of profit. Social historian Mike Davis first used the term in relation to California's penal system, which, he observed, already had begun in the 1990s to rival agribusiness and land development as a major economic and political force. To understand the social meaning of the prison today within the context of a developing prison industrial complex means that punishment has to be conceptually severed from its seemingly indissoluble link with crime. How often do we encounter the phrase, crime and punishment? To what extent has the perpetual repetition of the phrase crime and punishment in literature as titles of television shows, both fictional and documentary, and in everyday conversation made it extremely difficult to think about punishment beyond this connection? How have these portrayals located the prison in a causal relation to crime as a natural, necessary, and permanent effect, thus inhibiting serious debates about the viability of the prison today? The notion of a prison industrial complex insists on understandings of the punishment process that takes into account economic and political structures and ideologies, rather than focusing myopically on individual criminal conduct in efforts to curb crime. The fact, for example, that many corporations with global markets now rely on prisons as an important source of profit helps us to understand the rapidity with which prisons began to proliferate precisely at a time when official studies indicated that the crime rate was falling. The notion of a prison industrial complex also insists that the racialization of prison populations, and this is not only true of the United States, but of Europe, South America, and Australia as well, is not an incidental feature. Thus, critiques of the prison industrial complex undertaken by abolitionist activists and scholars are very much linked to critiques of the global persistence of racism. Anti-racist and other social justice movements are incomplete with attention to the politics of imprisonment. At the 2001 United Nations World Conference Against Racism held in Durban, South Africa, a few individuals active in abolitionist campaigns in various countries attempted to bring this connection to the attention of the international community. 
they pointed out that the expanding system of prisons throughout the world both relies on and further promotes structures of racism, even though its proponents may adamantly maintain that it is race-neutral. Some critics of the prison industrial system have employed the term correctional industrial complex and others penal industrial complex. These and the term I have chosen to underscore prison industrial complex all clearly resonate with the historical concept of a military industrial complex whose usage dates back to the presidency of Dwight Eisenhower. It may seem ironic that a Republican president was the first to underscore a growing and dangerous alliance between the military and corporate worlds, but it clearly seemed right to anti-war activists and scholars during the era of the Vietnam War. Today, some activists mistakenly argue that the prison industrial complex is moving into the space vacated by the military industrial complex. However, the so called war on terrorism initiated by the Bush administration in the aftermath of the 2002 attacks on the World Trade Center has made it very clear that the links between the military, corporate Operations and government are growing stronger, not weaker. A more cogent way to define the relationship between the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex would be to call it symbiotic. These two complexes mutually support and promote each other and, in fact, often share technologies. During the early 90s, when defense production was temporarily on the decline, this connection between the military industry and the criminal justice-slash-punishment industry was acknowledged in a 1994 Wall Street Journal entitled Making Crime Pay the Cold War of the 90s. Parts of the defense establishment are cashing in, too, sensing a logical new line of business to help them offset military cutbacks. Westinghouse Electric Corp., Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, GDE Systems, a division of Old General Dynamics, and Alliant Tech Systems, Inc., for instance, are pushing crime-fighting equipment and have created special divisions to retool their defense technology for America's streets. The article describes a conference sponsored by the National Institute of Justice, the research arm of the Justice Department, entitled Law Enforcement Technology in the 21st Century. The Secretary of Defense was a major presenter at this conference, which explored topics such as the role of the defense industry, particularly for dual use and conversion. Hot Topics, Defense Industry Technology That Could Lower the Level of Violence Involved in Crime Fighting. Sandia National Laboratories, for instance, is experimenting with a dense foam that can be sprayed at suspects, temporarily blinding and deafening them under breathable bubbles. Stinger Corporation is working on smart guns, which will fire only for the owner, and retractable spiked barrier strips to unfurl in front of fleeing vehicles. Westinghouse is promoting the smart car, in which mini computers could be linked up with big mainframes at the police department, allowing for speedy booking of prisoners, as well as quick exchanges of information. But an analysis of the relationship between the military and prison industrial complex is not only concerned with the transference of technologies from the military to the law enforcement industry. What may be even more important to our discussion is the extent to which both share important structural features. Both systems generate huge profits from processes of social destruction.
precisely that which is advantageous to those corporations, elected officials, and government agents who have obvious stakes in the expansion of these systems begets grief and devastation for poor and racially dominated communities in the United States and throughout the world. The transformation of imprisoned bodies, and they are in their majority bodies of color, into sources of profit who consume and also often produce all kinds of commodities, devours public funds which might otherwise be available for social programs such as education, housing, child care, recreation, and drug programs. Punishment no longer constitutes a marginal area of the larger economy. Corporations producing all kinds of goods, from buildings to electronic devices and hygiene products, and providing all kinds of services, from meals to therapy and health care, are now directly involved in the punishment business. That is to say, companies that one would assume are far removed from the work of state punishment have developed major stakes in the perpetuation of a prison system whose historical obsolescence is therefore that much more difficult to recognize. It was during the decade of the 1980s that corporate ties to the punishment system became more extensive and entrenched than ever before. But throughout the history of the U.S. prison system, prisoners have always constituted a potential source of profit. For example, they have served as valuable subjects in medical research, thus positioning the prison as a major link between universities and corporations. During the post-World War II period, for example, medical experimentation on captive populations helped to hasten the development of the pharmaceutical industry. According to Alan Hornblum, the number of American medical research programs that relied on prisoners as subjects rapidly expanded as zealous doctors and researchers, grant-making universities, and a burgeoning pharmaceutical industry raced for greater market share. Society's marginal people were, as they had always been, the grist for the medical pharmaceutical mill, and prison inmates in particular would become the raw materials for post-war profit-making and academic advancement. Hornblum's book, Acres of Skin, Human Experiments at Holmesburg Prison, highlights the career of research dermatologist Albert Kliegman, who was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Kliegman, the father of Retin A., conducted hundreds of experiments on the men housed in Holmesburg Prison and, in the process, trained many researchers to use what were later recognized as unethical research methods. When Dr. Kliegman entered the aging prison, he was awed by the potential it held for his research. In 1966, he recalled in a newspaper interview, All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. The hundreds of inmates walking aimlessly before him represented a unique opportunity for unlimited and undisturbed medical research. He described it in this interview as, an anthropoid colony, mainly healthy, under perfect control conditions. By the time the experimentation program was shut down in 1974, the regulations prohibited the use of prisoners as subjects for academic and corporate research. Numerous cosmetics and skin creams had already been tested. Some of them had caused great harm to these subjects and could not be marketed in their original form. Johnson & Johnson, Ortho Pharmaceutical, and Dow Chemical are only a few of the corporations that reaped great material benefits from these experiments. 
the potential impact of corporate involvement in punishment could have been glimpsed in the Kligman experiments at Holmesburg Prison as early as the 1950s and 1960s. However, it was not until the 1980s and the increasing globalization of capitalism that the massive surge of capital into the punishment economy began. The deindustrialization processes that resulted in plant shutdowns throughout the country created a huge pool of vulnerable human beings, a pool of people for whom no further jobs were available. This also brought more people into contact with social services such as AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, and other welfare agencies. It is not accidental that welfare as we have known it, to use former President Clinton's words, came under severe attack and was eventually disestablished. This was known as welfare reform. At the same time, we experienced the privatization and corporatization of services that were previously run by government. The most obvious example of this privatization process was the transformation of government-run hospitals and health services into a gigantic complex of what are euphemistically called health maintenance organizations. In this sense, we might also speak of a medical industrial complex. In fact, there is a connection between one of the first private hospital companies, Hospital Corporation of America, known today as HCA, and Corrections Corporation of America, CCA. Board members of HCA, which today has 200 hospitals and 70 outpatient surgery centers in 24 states, England, and Switzerland, helped to start Correctional Corporations of America in 1983. In the context of an economy that was driven by an unprecedented pursuit of profit, no matter what the human cost and the co-committant dismantling of the welfare state, poor people's abilities to survive became increasingly constrained by the looming presence of the prison. The massive prison building project that began in the 1980s created the means of concentrating and managing what the capitalist system had implicitly declared to be a human surplus. In the meantime, elected officials and the dominant media justified the new draconian sentencing practices, sending more and more people to prison in the frenzied drive to build more and more prisons by arguing that this was the only way to make our communities safe from murderers, rapists, and robbers. The media, especially television, have a vested interest in perpetuating the notion that crime is out of control. With new competition from cable networks and 24-hour news channels, TV news and programs about crime have proliferated madly. According to the Center for Media and Public Affairs, crime coverage was the number one topic on the nightly news over the past decade. From 1990 to 1998, homicide rates dropped by half nationwide, but homicide stories on the three major networks rose almost fourfold. During the same period when crime rates were declining, prison populations soared. According to a recent report by the U.S. Department of Justice, at the end of the year 2001, there were 2.1 million people incarcerated in the United States. The terms and numbers, as they appear in this government report, require some preliminary discussion. I hesitate to make unmediated use of such statistical evidence because it can discourage the very critical thinking that ought to be elicited by an understanding of the prison industrial complex. 
it is precisely the abstraction of numbers that plays such a central role in criminalizing those who experience the misfortune of imprisonment. There are many different kinds of men and women in the prisons, jails, and military detention centers whose lives are erased by the Bureau of Justice statistic figures. The numbers recognize no distinction between the woman who is imprisoned on drug conspiracy and the man who is in prison for killing his wife, a man who might actually end up spending less time behind bars than the woman. With this observation in mind, the statistical breakdown is as follows. There were 1,324,465 people in federal and state prisons, 15,852 in territorial prisons, 631,240 in local jails, 8,761 in Immigration and Naturalization Service Detention Facilities, 2,436 in Military Facilities, 1,912 in Jails in Indian Country, and 108,965 in Juvenile Facilities. In the 10 years between 1990 and 2000, 351 new places of confinement were opened by states and more than 528,000 beds were added, amounting to 1,320 state facilities, representing an 81% increase. Moreover, there are currently 84 federal facilities and 264 private facilities. The government reports from which these figures are taken emphasize the extent to which incarceration rates are slowing down. The Bureau of Justice Statistics report entitled Prisoners in 2001 introduces the study by indicating that the nation's prison population grew 1.1%, which was less than the average annual growth of 3.8% since year-end 1999.